the story of humankind and the story of technology and largely the story of art is so inextricably linked to time measurement and horology. We all are doing what we're doing, hopefully, to leave things in a little better place, to to leave a mark, to keep things progressing and moving forward. And the capturing and expression of of the past and of knowledge is 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 essential for our path forward. Welcome back to the Collectability Podcast. Today we are joined by Michael Friedman, a gentleman who I have heard described as quote, the most interesting man in the horological world, end quote. And you may have heard his name dropped in the Kendrick Lamar song, Rich Spirit, just last year. But there was a long road from his earliest days in Summit, New Jersey, to where he is now living and working in Switzerland. And that is what we are going to explore in part one of this two-part podcast with Michael Friedman. Before we begin, here's his official bio. Michael Friedman is the founder and director of the Pattern Recognition Agency. His extensive career in horology and passion for time theory has been a thrilling 25-year adventure, taking him from the world of museums to auction houses to brand consulting and into private curation. In 2013, Michael joined Audemars Piguet, where he served as historian for several years before becoming head of complications, embracing his simultaneous pursuits of history and futurism. Michael is a frequent lecturer, co-author of Audemars Piguet's 20th Century Complicated Wristwatches book, and has contributed to numerous articles, books, videos, and films, most recently, Keeper of Time. Michael is currently in design and development for the first model under his pattern recognition brand. He is also currently writing a new book that explores how popular culture has transformed and redefined the luxury watch space with dedicated chapters on Eric Clapton, John Mayer, Jay-Z, and Kendrick Lamar, and Dave Free, all of whom have been part of his personal journey. So here we go. Welcome, Michael. Wow, John, thank you. And by the way, you just reminded me it's not 25 years. It's actually now been 27 years. 27 years. It was 1996. 1996. And that journey started with you. And that's my first question. Let's go back to the basement that we first met. (laughs) Back to the basement. You got it. All right. Um, Well, let's see how we recall this, because we haven't done this in detail yet. This is true. But as I recall, I was already the assistant curator at Willard House and Clock Museum, North Grafton, Massachusetts. And at that point, I was already starting to be looking at the next position at the National Watch and Clock Museum in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And there was a period of time where a new assistant curator joined the team, and that was you. That was John Reardon. And we were down there. I think I'd already been at Willard House for several months before you joined. And it started out with just showing you the ropes a little bit about what was going on over there. And two young watch and clock nerds discovered each other, found each other, and realized we weren't entirely alone in the universe. This is true, because we did feel alone. And, and I remember the first time I met you, the curator explained to me, there's this another young gentleman who's obsessed with horology. You need to meet him. And I remember walking down the stairs uh, into the, 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 just the basement of the museum, essentially, and you were sitting at a bench. And that's when we first met. It's wild. And it's, it was incredible for me to meet someone else that had similar interests that I just didn't know there was a Michael Friedman that existed in the world. Well, likewise, and, you know, especially in that region, in that era, there wasn't even young people, let alone middle-aged people. Most of the people you and I were working with at that point were already quite old. These were people in their 60s and 70s, many of them. Of course, there were others as well. But I, I don't know if you recall this, but for me, I remember those that generation just being so happy to have young people interested in hearing their stories and learning their lessons that I just recall this energy from them of just wanting to, you know, to use a more modern notion, download their own stories and information and findings and learnings directly to us. I felt like we were just constantly in this process of learning from this incredible generation. And that was the beauty of that time. We just had to show some interest. You had to put a foot forward. You had to ask questions. And there was this incredible group of people that wanted to teach and share information. I tell my kids this all the time. It's just show some interest. Yeah. And there are people that are out there to, to help you. And, and I think we did that in the mid-90s. And we were very lucky to have some mentors, which we'll talk about momentarily, that really uh, embraced and, and taught us about the horological world. And I think for each other, it val- we validated that passion as well. 
Uh, yes. Because it's to be passionate about something takes a leap of faith. It, it incorporates into your identity and it starts to define you both consciously and, and subconsciously and the way that you're perceived by others. So I think one of my strongest positive memories about us meeting so early on in our careers was, yes, that sense of not being alone, but also that that sort of justification of like, hey, you know, this is it's cool to be into this in such a deep level. Because we also have to remember watches and clocks were so far from the mainstream conversation, mm -hmm. let alone even even the auction house trends. It was not a trendy era whatsoever. There were very, very few people who were very active in the space outside of the brands and outside of the museum institutions at that time. And I think we have to remind our listeners, this is over a decade before Hodinkee. I mean, this is just a whole other universe. Indeed. And uh, it there wasn't much information. The internet, okay, existed, but it didn't exist for information. There were chat rooms. We used books. We um, we had to use resources of the people we were meeting to learn oh, about well. what we wanted to study. Absolutely. And we visited museums often to do so. Not only yes. worked in one, but a big part of that was visiting the various institutions where you can learn about horology. I mean, I remember trips down to D.C. even just to look at old advertisements. Um, just to That's how we were able to piece all of this together. Every little bit of shred of information we could find anywhere would be incorporated into, into what we did. It was a treasure hunt. It was Something a treasure hunt. both love today. But this um, early path brought you to the NAWCC Museum. It what, did. What, how'd that happen? Well, at that point, the Willard House and Clock Museum was already uh, in association with the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, the NAWCC Museum. And I really enjoyed my time uh, curating. While I was at Willard House, I also did the the museum studies program at Harvard, so I was able to to build up my skill set. And I don't know if you recall, I also was doing an apprenticeship under the clockmaker David Gao. Of course. Right? You remember yes. David, who was the conservator at Willard House at the time. Very basic, but it taught me the basics of, of understanding how to deconstruct and put movements back together. You were ahead of me on that. You were, by the way, I don't know if your listeners know, before you were really into watches, clocks was your game. Yeah, John Reardon Clock Repair John, from Bristol, Connecticut. That's right. It's Bristol's finest clock repair company <laughs> in the 90s, early 90s. And we we loved clocks as much yes. as watches. We actually, we probably talked more clocks back then in that first year or two, even more than watches in the beginning. But I also think that set us up for an incredible foundation. Uh, what did working on the bench teach you that you still use throughout your career? It, well, it taught me, because of the diversity of projects we were working on, it really cemented for me that interdisciplinary nature of horology, which, of course, academically, I understood you can name all the different disciplines when you look at a watch or a clock. It's very easy to see that mm -hmm. this crosses over art, science, engineering, technology, etc. But until you're behind the bench and, and disassembling movements and cleaning them and putting them back together, that's when the empathy quotient goes up. So you, the EQ has to catch up with the IQ and in that sense. And that's what the bench work did. It introduced this whole level of empathy and sensitivity to the people behind the bench. And that's been a real foundation throughout my whole career. I, I tried to keep things as close to the bench as possible. Now, today, it's not just the watchmaker. It's also the technicians and the engineers. It's a The circle has grown, but the watchmaker is still the nucleus and the, the uh, engineers and technicians are the electrons, but they're all still all so significant to the process. So the bench work for me was was very much like the books. It gave me that sensitivity to the people behind it, not just to the ideas and the concepts and the history, but to the people. Now, going back to Columbia, Pennsylvania. Right, I never answered WCC your question. Yeah. What, did, what did you do there? So when we were at Willard House, I was contacted uh, by the NAWCC for the role of curator of collections uh, down there. And, and you were a kid. You were I was in your early 20s. I was super, super young. Yeah. And I, I, I'm sure they called a lot of other people before they got to me. But by that point, you and I had already earned some good credit with some incredible people of the era, Chris Bailey, Will Andrews, people like this who were so fundamental to the field that when I began, and for me most significantly, Robert Cheney. Robert Cheney, who's an incredible American horologist and was really my first, I would say, scholarly teacher in terms of not just clocks and watches, but how to decode what had been restored, what had been refinished, how to really, that forensic approach 
to to the business and field, Robert was foundational for me, and he was huge in getting me that role. And part of that was that he would be there to support me through him directly as well as his network of people. So I went down as a very young guy right at a time when they were doing a complete new renovation of the museum involving a whole new constructed building. Now, this is important because 20 years later, I went through this again at Audemars Piguet for mm -hmm. the AP Museum. So it was it was an incredible moment for me. So here we were on a construction site getting ready for this new museum. And it was an amazing experience and opportunity. So I had to tell the whole history of time measurement from ancient civilizations, pre-mechanical timepieces, all the way through GPS. So it was the first time where I was able to exercise everything I'd been learning and studying up to that point. Um, that for me has always been so interesting is that the story of humankind and the story of technology and largely the story of art is so inextricably linked to time measurement and horology. And that's really what I carry with me all the way through to this present day. And this is what you were you studied in, in college. You were studying time theory, I understand, in psychology. Yeah, I studied psychology at Clark University in the 90s, which was a very experimental time. And it was very, you were able to sort of create programs. On, and I worked under the psychology department under an incredible professor named Bernie Kaplan, who was my primary uh, professor there. And he was, he's since passed away a while back. And he was the one who introduced me to this notion of taking an interdisciplinary approach to subjects. And I started to fall into the subject of time quite early on. And we looked and explored time through multiple different disciplines and always bringing it back to psychology. And that was the beginning of me approaching pattern recognition as well, which is part of my life today. At that era, it was often folded under uh, Gestalt psychology, but it was also the term was starting to be used as well. And that idea that we anticipate the future based on the patterns we recognize from the past. So it's, it's temporally based. And that interests me so much, that that whole idea of this fusion of past, present, future, and how, I remember he, he would say things like, you, we all, we all predict the future in the sense that you anticipate a car crossing the street while you're, while you're driving while you're crossing the street. You know, you're always anticipating based on the patterns that you recognize. And it taught me to look at the world a different way. And then it also led to this real understanding of how significant time measurement devices have always been throughout culture, throughout society. Clark was also very, it was a great fertile place to study for cultural studies as well. So applying this notion of time and time theory and objects of time measurement across cultures also gave an incredible foundation. Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester, Massachusetts. A that's a beautiful right. place. Right? Yes. <laughs> it was a beautiful time though. It was, yeah, Worcester, Mass is, it's, uh, it's an interesting place to be at school, but I'm so grateful for my years at Clark University. It really gave an amazing foundation for everything and was very strong on critical thinking and inter interdisciplinary studies, which lend itself to horology massively. Uh, it certainly set the foundation oh, yeah. for you. Big time. So you're on this intellectual path and I love what you're what you're sharing with with us today, but then you had a phone call from Christie's, which is not an intellectual path. I say that respectfully. It's more of a commercial path. So you left the museum world and you went to New York. I did. Tell us about the next step of your career. Well, as you know, my family are all from New York. I was born in New Jersey, but I've lived most of my life or over half my life in New York. So it was the prospect of going back to New York was very exciting for me, but I also was very hesitant at first. I mean, really, it was, as you said, the museum world, it's its really where I thought I would be forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you remember this. You and very I, much. I mean, I don't, you and I, well, also, let's talk about where you were. Like, from 97 to 99, while well, I'm cur head curator of National Watch and Clock Museum. I was you, at Sotheby's. You're at yes. Sotheby's. And you and I spoke, I don't know if you recall, about the pros and cons of going to the auction side. Mm -hmm. And we were always very cognizant of what each other were up to. I mean, we, to, to this day, we're aware of what each other are doing and always have been each step along the way. So I spoke with you uh, when the job offer started to come in. And, and I remember that they were, Christie's was even a little, I don't want to use the word intimidated, but they were very much aware of the fact that we were friends. And 
shortly after I joined Christie's was during the time of all of the controversy between the brands. And I don't know if you remember, we weren't, we were told not to talk to each other. Yes, we were not allowed to talk. I wasn't able to speak to my fiance or you, a close friend at that point in time. It's very strange. That was very strange time. But so you look, I went with hesitation, but I also was fortunate to have incredible colleagues at Christie's right away. One of whom works with you today, Sabine Cagle. Yes whom Sabine was was and continues to be such an amazing presence in the watch field. And while my expertise at that point was so broad, right, I really focused, before I joined Christie's, my main interest in horology were Renaissance clocks, uh, the history of Asian horology, the more advanced technologies. Christie's gave me the opportunity to focus specifically on wristwatches, and, uh, and I needed teachers. And Sabine was very much ahead of the game for me at that point and was one of those people I didn't mention her before, but it's important to mention that today, that I, re I remember sitting with Sabine and, and Ruth Zandberg and deconstructing the differences between the Paul Newman and the standard Daytonas, which again, today, guys, is, is so mm -hmm. such standard knowledge. But back in 1999, there were no books. To, 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 you had to be shown what this was and shown what the indicators were. What was easy for me was determining what was real, what had been refinished, and what was original, because that was just... The taking the knowledge I knew from antique clocks and watches and applying it to these more contemporary wristwatches. And I think this, speaking of, of pattern recognition, to, to borrow the term, I never thought of it this way. What you learned from Robert Cheney, like the worldwide expert in American clocks, about forensic horology, which is very much part of uh, collecting uh, American clocks, as uh, we're discussing the bench, is really looking at uh, what's in front of you, what story that it tells, and deconstructing uh, the, the past and to know what's been restored, what's original, what's not. That didn't exist in the auction world. But then you, here you go, guns ablaze and walking into to Christie's, meeting some amazing, knowledgeable people such as uh, Sabine and Ruth in the world. But you had a toolbox that the auction world never saw before, and that's how to look at an object, interpret it, and tell its story, and ultimately express its value and rarity through forensics. Can you share more of, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of credit and it's well-deserved, but I want you to tell me, what do you think you brought to the world of horology that wasn't there before? In the world of wristwatch horology specifically? I, I think it was there. I don't know if it was represented at the auction houses yet. No. And what it was, was bringing the museum approach to the auction houses. It was not, it was turning over every stone possible of what is the reality of this object? What story does this object tell? What can we observe? And again, you know, back to Renaissance clocks, it's a little easier when you're looking at a Renaissance clock to see which components were produced later because, you know, the early iron composites were would then be changed out with brass and then later steel. So you could look at a Renaissance clock as, as a relatively young expert with the right teachers and determine quite readily and really come up with facts. Like this is clearly a later component. The metallurgy is not correct for the 16th century. Mm -hmm. So doing this time and time again and studying all of these different objects, then arriving into this world of wristwatches, it's, I was already wired this way. So even though I hadn't studied wristwatches in particular, I knew what fake hallmarks looked like. I knew what escapements that were changed looked like. I was able to look at the different materials and determine when things had been replaced or changed. So it was it was really this approach, but then emphasizing the significance of all of those details, because I had already met many collectors as well. And the notion of having a museum quality object was finally becoming significant in the watches world. Other departments in the auction houses already had this well established. But there's already PhD programs for other departments. So mm -hmm. art history, furniture, does, these types of categories already had this to a large extent. The watch world didn't, partly because of the complexity of being these interdisciplinary objects, cases, dials, movements, hands, components, right? They're very complex mechanisms. So I think it was that I, I brought this approach, which other people had been doing, but I think it was that I made it uh, a top priority. Condition reports making sure the condition reports were as extensive as possible. And it meant that we lost some watches to you or to others, right? Because it was, if you were just going to be absolutely as honest as you humanly could about an object, it wasn't 
you know, that the business was to get the watch in. So it could be scary to a client when you're sitting there saying, well, this is a beautiful watch, but the dial was refinished, very nicely done, but it's been reprinted at a certain point. These hands are replaced. Here's why we think this. The client is sitting there wanting to hear that their object is perfect and is going to bring a world record price. And I just didn't, and I still don't have that commercial bone in my body. The, the academic approach always comes first. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's, uh, that's just the way I'm wired. It just has to be this way. But that honesty was and is your brand. I mean, you are recognized as someone that says it as it is. And, and you're very, you're passionate. You use your knowledge. You make a statement. You back it up. And I think this really served you well in, in your auction career and your career as a whole. And in fact, a lot of people found your, your hidden talent and wanted to uh, befri befriend you or or hire you or be connected with you. And uh, that brings up the name. I have to, I, I'm going to, the biggest name drop ever is Eric Clapton came into your life during this period of time. And I think it's because of what you were doing is what he appreciated. And can you share some stories of how you met Mr. Clapton and how it connected, how you connected with him to help build this world-class collection? Sure, and I and I'm, I shared some of this with with our friend Ben over at Hodinki not yes. so long ago, a year ago or so, but uh, I won't do my accent again. I won't. I won't. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> and I, and I really encourage our listeners to go over to Hodinki Radio and listen to the interview with Ben Clymer and Michael Friedman. It is one to remember, and he oh, come on. Thank he you. gets into some really fun stories, and uh, so that that's my plug for Hodinki. But back back to you, <laughs> Michael. So look, Eric. I, I told the story before. I was initially contacted by um, an employee of his, a, a colleague of his, um, about Rolex sports watches. And I just did what I always do. I didn't know who, who, who it was. I just gave as much information as I knew, viewing this as a, as a great possible client for, for Christie's. And that was it. Nothing more, mm -hmm. nothing less. And Eric just responded very favorably to this openness and this willingness to share information and, and immediately contacted me by phone and and we we started to work together. We started to communicate together. And Eric had other advisors and was had already been buying watches for quite a while. I mean, his you can see great watches on his wrist going even back to the late sixties during his time with the Yardbirds and Cream. There's there's often a cool watch on his wrist and photographs and things like this. So it was it was a great pleasure because of this, how specific his interests and passions were. And this was really an indicator of what was coming down the road, was collectors up to that point tended to be a little bit more general. Um, you remember some of those old school collectors who would buy across a brand or across a case material or across a shape. It was these broader categories. With Eric, it was this very specific. I'm interested primarily in Daytona's and roll and protect 2499s. So this from a scholarly standpoint this becomes incredible because the narrower the focus is the deeper mm -hmm. we can dive because we have more time to do so. And being part of that world who was helping acquire and source these pieces for Eric was incredible because it allowed me to interact with some incredible people and collectors. And then, of course, as you know, during this time, a few other Americans emerged as major collectors of those watches as well, whom we were closely associated with as well. So it was it was really wild to be able to be in the middle of these incredible watches before there was any buzz for it in the modern sense. There was no hype about the, these watches. It was just a handful of collectors who were passionate to acquire the best examples possible. Now, the 2499 was obviously already celebrated, but it wasn't, it wasn't hype. It was just because it, it's celebrated for the right reason. It's one of, I've said it before and I'll say it again, it is hands down one of the greatest watches of the 20th century in terms of complexity, in terms of aesthetic balance, in terms of execution, finishing, everything. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's in a, I don't need to tell you. I'm no, it's with, music I'm with to my band. ears, yes. <laughs> um, and it's, it's such a watch so worthy of being celebrated that to be able to work with people like Eric and others on helping source these watches was also a discovery process. Because when you're looking at so many, you see the different retailer signatures, the different stamps, the, the different uh, the different features, the different dial aesthetics. This this was incredible because the books again weren't written. We were doing this in real time. You ended up writing the book a few years later. Yeah, I want to thank you again. You reminded me earlier. You were instrumental 
in the early editing back in 2007 of Patek Philippe in America. I think I was a help. I don't know instrumental. I think maybe I was an instrument, but not necessarily instrumental. No, I remember it well. I remember where I was editing your book because it was, I was first of all, incredibly honored that you came to me and said, look, dissect this for me. Tear this. You said to me, Mm -hmm. tear this apart, find my mistakes. And you gave me the blessing to really, to, to, to approach. To challenge me. Yes. Yeah. And there wasn't much, by the way, but it did allow me to go through the book page by page, reference number by reference, caliber by caliber, and uh, it was it was such a great experience. And your what you went through in creating that book was very much on my mind when I was writing the AP book together with Sebastian Vivas, who's the director, museum director over at AP. I thought a lot about your book and the approach that you took and, uh, and the level of depth you went to across the aesthetics and the technical side of the watches. And then, if I recall, your next edition was the more advertising-oriented book where you bring in the sort of cultural picture. I tried to weave those two ideas together in the AP uh, complicated book. But I loved working on your project back then, and I remember where I was, the bedroom I was in, I was living on Court Street in Brooklyn Heights, mm-hmm. where I lived for a long time, and uh, it was a great pleasure, man. I love, I, and I oh. still love that book. I just want to, I want to thank you because it just oh, it just shows how our parallel lives just they kept intertwining at the, at the most random times and because we are we're on this like same mission in life we are but sometimes I remember I would be when you were with the auction house mm-hmm. I was at the museum shortly after I joined the auction house uh, once I joined Christie's you were at Sotheby's for a little while but then you left to join Patek Philippe if I remember correctly. So I left, I was, uh, wow, I went to Sotheby's and then I went to uh, Patek Philippe, of course, for a decade. And that's why that was during your museum era. And then I went back to Sotheby's for two seconds before Christie's. That brings me to the year 2013. In 2013, you experienced one of the biggest turning points of your life. And it was the same for me. That's when I went to Christie's. But you, you went to Switzerland and joined Audemars Piguet as historian. Can you tell us about how you ended up going to Switzerland. Well, okay, so I I first, my first project with Audemars Piguet was in the year 2000 for the first time to give auction for Ali and Schwarzenegger. And and I knew AP was a very different brand already. I mean, it was such an incredible project and I, I stayed in touch with them over the years. And while I was more associated during the early 2000s with Patek Philippe, Vintage and Rolex, my appreciation for Audemars Piguet was increasing drastically. And I was starting to acquire a couple pieces and so forth. And when I left AP, when I left Christie's in 03, I had my own business for 10 years and I loved it and it was profitable, but it was so private and confidential and, and ruled and governed by NDAs. So I really wanted to get back into the public sphere more, back into the educational side, back to my origins of why I advise a handful of people when I can be engaging, teaching and learning from many, many people. And this coincided with, with Francois Benamias was then transitioning from the U.S. CEO to the global CEO. So he and I had a conversation, and he essentially helped create a position for me. Um, And initially, it was 50% U.S., 50% Switzerland, because I wasn't ready to move full-time over there. And yes, the first role was initially as historian, with primary emphasis on helping develop the vintage brand, helping introduce collectors to the brand, both vintage and contemporary. And most excitingly for me, really getting back to my roots, was soon after I started, I got very deep in what became the Audemars Piguet Museum project, which was uh, the architect was Bjarke Ingels. So that worked very well because Bjarke was based between Denmark and New York, between Copenhagen and New York. He was often in New York. And since I was there 50% of the time, it was great for AP to have somebody there in real time working with the architect. So I had this incredible opportunity to be working both on the exhibitions and the content with the museum team, as well as with the architect on, let's say, the the bigger vision of, the, of what the museum was going to be like experience. It was incredible experience in, in every sense. And I loved every every minute of it. Sounds like the dream job. It was really cool. It was a really cool job and, and an amazing team. And and like many of the brands today have invested more and more in their heritage departments. This is so significant. I mean, this is just you can't put a value on it because it's not just about preservation. This isn't the classic museum approach. This is also about the proliferation of knowledge and of passion. 
And it, it's not about being a vintage expert, but everybody, even the contemporary watch lovers, and I'm very much far more in the world of contemporary watches today and futuristic watches, but you still want to know the origin points. You still want to know how things came to be the way that they are in every field and in every discipline. So I, I give huge, huge respect to the brands today, Audemar Piguet, Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantin, um, Tag Heuer. There's just great talent that are at these brands who are working towards the not just the preservation of knowledge, but the teaching, the education, and the contextualization of this history. Because we're all future history. You know, we're as you and I know, 27 yes. years in, we're all future history, and and that's something that we lose sight of in the present. And I think. We all are doing what we're doing, hopefully, to leave things in a little better place, to to leave a mark, to keep things progressing and moving forward. And the capturing and expression of of the past and of knowledge is 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 essential for our path forward. Speaking of moving forward, after a few years as a historian, you became uh, AP's head of complications. This must have just opened up a whole other world for you. What what were those years like? I was so ready for this. I, yes. I mean, I always wanted to get to product. We're back to the bench, right? Back to mm -hmm. the workshop with with David Gao and Robert Cheney. And my my friendships with the watchmakers, technicians, and engineers at Audemars Piguet were, were, grew over the years dramatically. And I had been advised on different watch projects, both museum, but also contemporary watches. So it was just a real dream opportunity to, to create a new department focusing specifically on the complications at a time when Audemars Piguet was increasing the quantities, introducing new movements, new calibers, and a whole new generation of, of, of mechanisms. So to be able to work 360 on those was incredible. To be sitting in meetings with with Giulio Papi and Luca Raji at origin points, but then also being the person who would be presenting these watches to the public was, I believe, new for the industry. And I didn't have a leadership role by any means in the movement development or anything, but I was invited to the party. And you know me, John, that's that's all. I just, just to have a seat at the table was, was more than enough for me. And most Americans aren't brought to the table in Switzerland. This is true. This is true. Sensitive uh, question. Not a question, but actually, I'll make it a question. What was that like? It was challenging. Because you didn't speak French at that point of and time. And I still, my, my French is still very, ask my four-year-old daughter or my wife <laughs> or my even my two-year-old son. Uh, no, my French is still pretty bad. I do my best, but it's it's tough. It, it I had to earn that I had to earn those th those positions and those roles just through blood, sweat, and tears, and and passion, and 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 just pouring my heart out to it. And you're right; it's 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 hard for anybody to to get a seat at those tables, and it didn't come right away. It came over time, and I'm incredibly grateful to to from the leadership all the way throughout the company for, for at, at Audemars Piguet for giving me those chances and opportunities. And I learned a tremendous amount, and and I hope that I brought something to the table as well. I hope I left the complications. Um, in a way that was more evolved and and looking forward uh, for the brand and for the company. I, I love that brand, and I always always will have a strong association with them. When and why did you leave AP? It was time. I mean, it was, you know, when you start to see 50 approaching, there was so many changes internally at AP happening. I had achieved a lot, and you realize that it's time to forge your own path. And I had been... There, there's been ideas in my mind that had been percolating for a long time about things that I want to see created, things that I want to see made, approaches that I want to take. And I wasn't going to progress further within the company. I had hit a peak, which was a great peak to hit. But you reach a point in any field, in any business, in any career, as you know, where to do the next steps means sometimes we take an entrepreneurial path. And that was the decision, was to leave, to begin consulting other brands, as well as to start developing my own timepieces. And the network of, of former colleagues that were already out doing this was tremendous. So I was able to step right into an amazing network of people who were already on the independent side, but with great pedigree from major brands who welcomed me open arms to start collaborating and working with them. Well, congratulations. And we're so excited to hear more in part two Thank about you. your new initiative. Um, but as we wrap up part one, I want to go back to that time where you were a private curator 
and ask you a few Patek Philippe questions. Oh, always. You, you know I yes. love diving deep, and I'm with I'm with you. So, of course, I expect this. It's uh, collectability. So Come on, let's you, go. Let's you, go deep Patek. You already mentioned 2499s, but I want you to name your three, the three most important references in your mind, historically, for the brand. The most important. So, okay, so a more objective question and, and a more objective kind of answer I'll give. We talked about the 2499 and its significance. I think the 2524 has to be mentioned, the minute repeater. It was the Patek Philippe minute repeater in terms of the aesthetics of the watch, the position of the slide, the shape of the lugs, the bezel, the, sim the simplicity of the design at a quick glance. But then when you start investigating those watches closer, the amount of detail throughout the movement and case are just impeccable. There's such a beauty in those watches. I've always always love those and always will. They were just something different. And they, Patek wasn't the only company doing Patek doing minute repeaters at that time. Um, AP were doing repeaters in the vintage era, Vacheron, Constantine, and others. But the 2524 holds a very, very... Um, that's the correct reference, Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. Without a doubt. Then the others, very close reference number, but a very different watch, which we have to recognize how massively influential is, of course, the 2523, the world time. That's the correct yes, reference, right, John? Yeah. And you just look at contemporary watches today. The Louis Cartier system, which was adopted by Patek mm -hmm. Philippe and perfected by Patek Philippe, is still visible today everywhere we look. It's 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 perfection. And it's it's also a canvas. I love using the word canvas because it's we're very quick to talk about the technology and the mechanisms, but horology is, is an art first and foremost. It's artisan. You know, I've mentioned before the word art derives from the word artisanship. You know, these are these historically these were not separate notions or ideas, and the twenty five twenty three the world time was such it's such a reminder of this notion. Now it wasn't the only model to receive enamel dials, but I think they were the most championed and probably the most complex. We had enamel dials in the 2526s, of course, and some of my favorite enamel dials are on the rectangular series, the 2441s and 2s, which you know how much I love 9 line 90 movements, and I talk about them a lot. I adore those watches. But in terms of historical significance, I would go those three. I would go the, the 2499, the 25, the, the minute repeater, 2524 yeah, 5, 2, and 2523 in terms of the impact, the lasting impact on watches today and into the future. So if you had to choose to wear on a daily basis, a 2499, a 2524 or a 2523, not considering value, but just to have on the wrist, which piece would you pick? If I could, if it not, honestly, not looking at value, just in terms of the appreciation of, 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 of the watch itself. I love all of them, but it would end up being probably the most discreet, which is not always the case for me, but it would be the 2524 Platinum, that, that, that watch. I just, I, I dream about that watch. It's just, it's just, it's just perfect. I love all of them, but that would be the one. That would be the one. And seeing the trend towards wearing smaller watches, I mean, a 2524 on, on a wrist is just perfection. It really is. It really is. I, I, about as discreet as it gets. Too. It is. And I love that we're seeing smaller watches again. And I don't think it's, you know, I don't even think it's going to be about one or the other. I think what's happening with watch sizes is very similar to what we see in fashion, music, film, elsewhere. People are just going to be open to different aesthetics. You might have collectors who prefer large or prefer smaller, but we're going to see the same collector wearing watches of, among many different sizes as we do. I mean, you, you know, 20 years ago, John, there was no... There was it was the distinction between vintage collector and modern collector was huge, and today it barely exists. That's Bare, true. Barely exists. Most modern collectors have a few vintage, or at least respect and appreciate, and vintage collectors have huge appreciation and admiration for what's happening today on the contemporary watch scene, both with the big brands as well as the independents. What is the secret to collecting in the the right way? I mean, is, is there a right way? I don't think there's a right way at all. I think that watch collecting is so tied to the state of mind and being we are in in the moment. And when you collect over a lifetime, these objects become symbolic of those different points in our life. And what I encourage people to do is not sell unless you really have to. Nothing wrong with selling watches, right? That's great to sell watches and to make room for your collection. But when something has an emotional impact on you, that's the watch to keep because those are time machines unto themselves. Watches have watches and clocks and objects of time measurement are, have always been linked to memory. 
I mean, that's even today we give watches at births, at weddings, things like this, and watches are passed down when somebody passes away. So when a watch, I think the secret is recognizing when those moments are happening in life, taking stock, taking meditating on it. And if there's a watch in association with that, knowing, especially if you're younger in your 20s, those are going to be very significant to you later on in life. I didn't wear it today, but one of my favorite vintage watches is a is a large rectangular curved Illinois watch. Hmm. And I adore it. It's it's beautiful. And it's not valuable at all, but it means everything to me. And it's a big influence on what I'm creating today. Going back to your psychological background, uh, three questions. First, why do people collect? Why do people collect anything? It's 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 what I was touching upon just before. We we capture a moment in time. It's a form of it's a form of psychological time travel in that sense. It's immense moments. We are able to understand ourselves more and each other more through the objects that we admire. We're also able to better situate where we're at today based on a deeper understanding of things from the past. You know, Art Deco jewelry is a great example. And Art Deco jewelry was always going to be celebrated, not only because the aesthetics are so powerful and geometric and and were influential across all disciplines, but also because of the execution at that era was so high. And ever, the level of hand craftsmanship was was so incredible. It was the transition from what's done by hand in combination with machines. So it's all of these different things. But I think most importantly, it's it's a reflection of ourselves. The closer we put something to our body, the more it's a reflection of ourselves. And this is the power of watches and jewelry. It's so close to identity and, and self-expression. And it's it's this is why I always associate watches with things like music and art, because it's not just what we love, it's also becomes representative of who we are or who we are striving to be or how, we're, or how we wish to be perceived. And, and considering your answer to the part one of this three-part question, I'm going to give you part two and part three together because no one's really explored this. So the, the second question is, what triggers people to buy these objects? And then the third part is what triggers people to sell these objects that's the part that really intrigues me i think what triggers i think we when you're in a collector mindset buying is almost isn't a choice when we see something that we know we want for our collection if it's within our means and if it's something that we can we can we can accommodate financially it's it, it's not a question and the beauty of watches is we don't have to worry about space you don't have to worry about storage. You know, it's different with cars. Even paintings can be tricky when you have a large paintings collection. With watches, we have that ability and flexibility to have a large, larger collection in a very small briefcase, which makes it very opportunistic. But it's not a choice when you're a collector and you see something that you know you want to have. It could be a better example of something you already have. So you're just chasing, you're chasing a, the best version of, of whatever that model is, which you love. So people will trade out to trade up towards something else. Um, it could be a different case material. You know, we, you and I have seen this often with a model I mentioned before, 2526. Very plentiful in yellow but not so much in rose. So we know people who love 2526s who will start with a yellow one and then as a rose one appears or even a more exotic one, uh, if they have the means of doing so, um, they will often trade up or acquire that one in addition to the other one too. And the other reason we sell is connected to that. If we find a better example of something we're pursuing, we tend to sell the one that's inferior to, to make room. We don't always want a, a, a grade A and a grade C in the same collection. Some people don't. Other people just hoard and, and keep it all. And that's okay. That's okay too. Um, that's one side of it. And then the other side of it, without a doubt, many of us, not all of us, but many of us are also capturing our past. You know, what we what we grew up admiring, this is referred to often as like the 30-year cycle. And we've seen this throughout the last century, right? We You always see these throwbacks. And this isn't, again, just in collecting. This is across all of culture, music and fashion and film and everything. We tend to want to recapture our youth. And the older generation always thinks the younger one is crazy. I mean, if you, if you told in the 90s, if you spoke to Ferrari collector about the Dino, they would be like the six cylinder no over angular car. There's no, what are you talking about? Our generation were like, that's why we love it, the hard angles. 
And this is something, again, look at Nautilus Royal Oak. It's a very mm -hmm. similar trajectory. 30-year cycle. 30 year, when you and I were, ki were younger in this business, mm -hmm. those watches were not collectible at, at all. all. The baby boomers wanted what they grew up with, what they saw their fathers and mothers wearing. They wanted those pieces from the 40s and the 50s and the early 60s. But the timeline is constantly moving forward. And that, 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 those, those, that scope of acceptability is changing. What I think is beautiful with younger generations is the timeline is getting extended, both in, in not just in, in watches, but in everything. So because of the access of information and knowledge, young people are looking well beyond the 30-year cycle now, listening to music 50, 60 years old, or film, um, or watches, or jewelry, or whatever. And I think this is incredibly exciting. And that's what I went back earlier about how it's not about big or small. I just think the tent is getting bigger and bigger, and the scope of acceptability is getting wider and wider. And that's the perfect segue to my final question. As, as a futurist and a horologist, your answer to this question is, is pivotal, especially for the collectability audience. What is the future of Patek Philippe collecting? What's it going to look like in 10 years? What's it going to look like in 50 years? That's, an, that's a fa fascinating question, one I haven't even thought of. So I'm glad you didn't share these with me ahead of time because I'm giving this to you right off the cuff. I think the future of Patek Philippe collecting, it's, it's always changing. Okay, because again, let's let's we know what Patek Philippe watches bring tremendous values today, but we also know that some of those watches that the baby boomers were after are at 20-year lows right now. Some of those 9990 movements that I mentioned before, which are just beautiful and rare watches, the 2441s, 42s, 1590s, yeah, top hats, Eiffel Towers, top hats, exactly. bananas, yeah. Eiffel Tower. I mean, these watches are they're really good value right now. They're incredible value. Mm -hmm. But I think that's it. And and I think the future of it is going to be less emphasis on individual models and a, a broader collecting pool. And that's something that collectability has been bringing to the table since you guys came onto the scene. You know, you were there to, yes, you were educating people from day one about 1518s and 2499s and these legendary models, but you were also there reminding people of incredible Patek Philippe's that weren't yet trendy. I remember you wore an Aquanut eight, two decades ago. Yes. Two decades ago, and even I was like, "Dude, what's that on your wrist?" And you were like, "I love this watch. This is this is the this is the you said this is the ultimate everyday Patek Philippe watch you could ever want. I can do anything with this watch on." And here we are. I've been wearing it over twenty years. I know. It's, it's beat to crap, and I love it. <laughs> but but that wasn't the case back then to, for, in terms of what was hot or collectible or what people were really seeking. But for you, as a younger person, saw the utility and the beauty in experiencing that watch and and now it's caught up with you right now it's people understand that more and more i think the future of collecting patek philippe is incredibly strong it's going to be broader we might not see the sort of craziness over certain models but that's true across all brands and i i hope for this because when we have everybody concentrated on very few models that's wonderful for those models but it's at the expense of all of the incredible work done by all of these other dial makers, case makers, movement makers, designers, et cetera, from throughout history. So I'm hoping we're going to see a more, more equilibrium in that sense. And that's where I think it's going to go. And again, that's what's so significant about entities like collectability and, uh, and other dealers and experts and enthusiasts who share their collections. What is the state of the watch world today? So right now, I think we're in an era of possibility. We're in a design explosion, but we're also in an era that requires checks and balances and to make sure that the, the each product that's being created is truly representative of the brand's vision and ethos and mission of, of, of who's creating that watch. And to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes. This is John Reardon for Collectability. <laughs>